God of the universe, maker of the stars, who am I? So you can probably see we're already laughing and we don't, I just, I want everybody to know that there's no joy before we start. We push this record button. There's mm -hmm. just, there's absolute seriousness, solemnity, stoicism, whatever kind of straight faced adverb you want to put in there, adjective, that's, that's what's going on. No laughter whatsoever. Mm -hmm. But You're since lying. we just did, <laughs> uh, you know, and, yeah, yeah, I'm lying. I'm sorry. I'm lying. We, we have a great time before during and after the yeah. podcast and then we're thankful for anyone who is here listening having a great time with mm -hmm. us so we welcome yeah. you to episode number 20 somethings of life on purpose um yes. you are joined by me myself and i uh, <laughs> what was that 51 <laughs> 26 26, 26. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no you are joined by me daniel clayton mm -hmm. this guy you are joined by ryan cribs Sometimes hatted, sometimes unhatted. That's right. You are joined by Dave Covert, who, <laughs> yes, he has the hat this time, his famous Yeshua hat. Yes. Um, and you are joined by none other, the one, mm -hmm. the only, mm -hmm. the infamous mm -hmm. Mike Clayton. Mike yeah. Clayton, <laughs> also known as Top Dog or Dad. So, <laughs> Top Dog. <laughs> and, and also known by Abby as the old guy that was going to come in and be boring while, while speaking. Thanks, Ooh, Abby. You know, if you wrote another book, that'd probably be your bio. <laughs> <laughs> that probably would be. Or the foreword. Just yeah, the there foreword you go. before the this book. This is just a book by another old guy. I can't relate. <laughs> oh, hey, I guess, yeah, this sounds good, man. I, I think I, I like might this. have a, may, maybe that's a new message. Oh, there you go. Yeah. I think there's something there. Instead of, yeah, I mean, that's a title I would buy at a bookstore, like Thoughts from an Old Boring Guy. You know? <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Yeah, let's go ahead and write that one down, jot it down. All right. Okay. And may maybe instead of the, you know, the t-shirt that says uh, Old Guy's Rule, I can say This Old Guy Relates. Hey, there you go. That, yeah. that kind of rings. Yeah. Yeah. We got some options yeah. here. Okay. Well, let's so move anyway. On. We're going to talk about some stuff, but before we talk about some stuff, we're going to talk about some stuff. So, Dave, yes. there's yeah. a thing coming up. So, kind of just because uh, you have a chance to see us pretty soon, all four of us, instead of just uh, two of us or in separate areas, we're all going to be together in Wilkesboro, North Carolina. Or just this much of April. us? Oh, yeah, just this much of us. Just <laughs> I'm just mailing a bust of myself there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you can see us April <laughs> I timed it perfectly so, is what happened. Yeah, you did. You exactly <laughs> did. That was good. You did. We, we clearly are having way too much fun. Right. So yeah. last week I butchered the scheduling of this whole thing because we were still in the middle of our website development. I think finally the website and the schedule have finally, finally had their I's dotted and T's crossed. It's probably going to change again. But anyways, <laughs> April 14th, Wilkesboro, North Carolina, the website might be a little tricky. One a cord.com so don't think of a cord like in the vehicle but one accord that was we are in one accord musical chord so, c-h-o-r-d yeah. yes exactly mm. one accord.com uh, and it's and one o-n-e right <laughs> yes o-n-e yes not just yep. one o-n-e a c-h-o-r-d.com mm. there you can get the schedule you could sign up it's a free event or free event, but there is a charge if you want to have food that's already prepared so that on Shabbat, you don't have to think about that, worry about it. We're just trying to get that all gathered up. Uh, people have been registering like crazy. So get in there. It's again, it's a free event, but we do charge for trying to get food prepared so that you could be there, but you'll be able to see all of us and we'll have a ton of fun along with a lot of other people, excuse me, music, teaching, but teaching that's geared towards getting you just fired up. So we're super excited about it. So if you've enjoyed these podcasts and enjoyed hearing what we've talked about, I think you're going to get a little taste of that because I know that Michael's been going around places just recently too, like he talked about before. How was that, Michael? Well, I, you know, as I, as I uh, just kind of briefly mentioned, guys, if you were um, this past, uh, if this past Shabbat, if you were noticing in your congregations that there was 
uh, a bit of an absence of God's presence is because we had it all up in oh, Winchester. Oh, is that right? right? <laughs> wow. It was over Ooh. the top. Amazing. Uh, got to spend some wonderful time with uh, with Abe and with Sean heading over to another place. They put me in a car and I they just said, OK, well, we're driving you over to another congregation. This is Friday night. I had no idea where I was at uh, <laughs> and really didn't care. I mean, uh, Abe that, that was driving, we had a great time conversation. What an amazing young man this he is. Um Got back that night. Uh, I did a little meeting with some folks that are going to Israel with me. We did a youth service for about two hours. And um, yes, Boring, that's right. right. Uh, Abby, um, yeah, she told her mom, yeah, I just thought it was another old guy who wouldn't know how to relate. And she said, but he did a pretty good job. So, uh, you know, I'm just going to take that one to the bank, really. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, uh, no, we had a wonderful time with uh, some some great young people there. And then the main service and uh, got to uh, spend a little time with our mutual friend, Dustin Trapp. Love you, Dustin. Dustin. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> one, the one, the only, and we're thankful for because the world could not handle two of him. No, <laughs> the incomparable. <laughs> That's yes. right. That but is true. Uh, in the midst of that, get to meet a uh, another young man um, that was there, and um, I, I won't go into a lot of the details just for his own privacy. But uh, it's he actually is the um, his his calls kind of the subject of our of our broadcast tonight. Um, how, the extremes that the father goes to to find someone to show them that they're special and to speak to them. And uh, I had the amazing privilege of praying with him on Shabbat to receive Messiah, uh, mm. talking with him briefly, you know, oh, quite yeah. a bit afterwards, actually on, on, uh, um, on messenger or text or carrier pigeon or something. I can't remember which, what we're using, but uh, I, I won't give you names right now, but I can tell you that um, this, this young man is going to, to be a force to be reckoned with uh, yeah. against the kingdom of darkness. I just mm -hmm. know that with, with all my being. So uh, without, uh, without giving names or anything, if any of you just, you know, you got a little time to pray, just uh, pray for this, this young man. God, believe me, God knows who he is. Okay. Mm -hmm. He definitely does know who he is. So uh, with that guys, we wanted to talk a little bit about uh, some parables and Daniel, you led at Life Assembly this past week and actually talked a little bit around this. Um, yeah, yeah. Intentionally, so, but that's normally how it works. Of yeah, yeah. <laughs> true. So, um, who wants to start us off here? I think Ryan should. He's he's been too quiet lately. Oh my goodness! <laughs> Always quiet. My goodness. <laughs> well, our uh, it looks like our parable this week is going to be on the lost coin. Hmm. And it's going to be in yeah. Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 8. And so I'll, it's 8 to 10. I'll go ahead and read actually what it says so we have some context here for everybody. It says, Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I have lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Mm. That's fitting. That's pretty powerful. She's got ten. She loses one. She finds it and rejoices more over the one than she does over the having the ten. Okay. What's your thoughts oh, on that, guys? There's a lot there. Yeah, I was about to say, where, where do you go with this? Because there's so much. Um I guess I'll just jump into it because, I mean, you're – without trying to go towards the previous one because that's about the lost sheep, and there's just so many good things that come from that one, right? Because it says, or, which, in my translation, it's saying. So it's like you can't – don't try to focus on this one. Uh, 
Yeah, the imagery is because we Passover's coming very soon, and the whole idea was to uh, sweep out all eleven. That's the imagery that's in my mind when I'm hearing this right off the bat. It's like sweeping the entire house, looking for that lost coin. Is in Passover we're looking for something that's bad, which is the leaven. So we're looking for it, and we're searching for it, and we're trying to dispose of it. But in this situation, mm. it's in the context of looking for something that's of value. So that's also interesting. The same way that we would look so that we would not sin, it's a positive thing to search your house to get rid of the bad. In the same way, I think this is kind of in a, in a way of replicating that because if you think of it too, there's also the imagery of 10 coins, one being lost. I'm thinking of the Joseph story, right? The whole 10 tribes, the Joseph story. Like, okay, that's, okay, well, I'm gonna leave that off to the side. But that's kind of where I'm taking this, looking at it from that perspective is that, and it kind of gives us a little context. I know from the previous parable about the lost sheep, a little bit of that context, but it's kind of leading from that. So to think of it in that sense of searching out something, and I think everybody's been in that situation of where's my keys? Where'd my wallet go? I can't help but think that this in that same situation, we can all relate to this woman, how she's lost a coin and she's looking for it. And then I think about a woman and a coin, and I'm thinking about, the widow's might, how much that was versus the wealth that that one man brought and how all these parables are kind of tying together. So I'm just like, okay, there's all these things now trying to focus in on one. I'd love to see, I don't know, Daniel, if you said you talked a little bit about this. So where'd you go when, when it came to this? Cause there's a lot we I was, here. Yeah. I, I honestly can't remember exactly where I touched. I think, uh, you know, we were just talking about parables um, on Shabbat. We were talking about mm -hmm. um, specifically the parable of the, the banquet where there was the one guy that did not have the wedding garment on. Um, mm -hmm. But we were kind of talking about the, the inclusivity of the kingdom and the nature in which God wants to make it inclusive to all people. Like, you know, not by, not by means of just grabbing anyone and letting them do whatever they want, but, you know, someone who is j just anyone that you see. And, and Peter, it says it is his desire for all people to be saved. Mm -hmm. So that kind of inclusivity. And so what I was kind of bouncing this off of was that the joy of that one being lost, you know, the inclusivity of the, the one. Um, and I like how you mentioned the keys because that is one thing that comes to my mind with this is how real it is. You know, it's very simple. It's to the point, there are times I'm walking around the house and just, where did I leave that thing? And there is a, a certain amount of joy that is like you know, a relief almost of mm -hmm. finding that thing. And I'm, I know there's a lot more in here. And I'm sure that there was a, I'm hoping someone knows a little bit of context behind this and how it would have been applicable to the day, because I don't know that. I just know maybe the simple approach and uh, got mm -hmm. another thought, but I'll pitch it over to someone else for now. Right. And by the way, guys, you know, I mean, this is our program. So if you want to go to different parables, we can. <laughs> <laughs> no, gotcha. we got to stay on this parable. We're on mission. <laughs> yeah. I didn't publish a bulletin. I just sent a text out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or like what happened previously before anyone else takes over, we get a parable or something. Sometimes the show kind of takes it on mind of its own and all of a sudden God kind of takes over and just says, no, we're going this route. So yeah. I agree. Yeah, let's let's sure. roll with it. I had a couple thoughts on this as I was reading it. Um, and one is I, I noticed that it also doesn't mention the denomination of the coins. It just mm -hmm. says silver coins. We could have had many different denominations. There are coins even of greater value. Uh, so it's not necessarily about what you think your value is. It's the value that the owner places upon you, your owner mm -hmm. being your creator, uh, which I thought was important to note. Um, but also that word lost was interesting because when we think of something lost in our, our English uh, mindset, we think of something that we you know just can't be found. It still exists, but cannot be found. Mm -hmm. um, the actual Greek there, uh, and I'm probably going to butcher the pronunciation, but it looks like it's um, apolumi, which is that which is perished, um, destroyed, ruined, mm -hmm. brought to nothing, put to death, uh, to lose wow. utterly. Um, and that, that carries quite a bit more than just I can't yeah. find it. I mean, th yeah, this was something sure. that was 
gone, at, like irretrievable, basically. Uh, mm-hmm. Okay, Ryan, let me let me throw something in, and then I want you to take it back. Um, how about we look at it in light of the Torah, hmm, which, of course, everything goes back to the foundation of the first five books. So this this is about a uh, this coin. It's is about something that's perished. Could we look at it as something that has been cast outside the camp because of sin? Mm-hmm. Yes. Or uncleanliness. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, something that would be considered put to death, uh, or even like somebody who might say, um, "I know we've heard of the stories of people being you know, like disowned by their family, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, and treated mm-hmm. as if they were dead uh, to to those that their loved ones, uh, if you will." And so then being restored, I mean, just imagine that level of joy. I, that far, I think that far exceeds the level of joy of just, oh, I, I lost something and I found it again. This mm-hmm. was something that was unobtainable to you until it was returned in that sense. Hmm. I think that's pretty profound. For sure. So, you know, th- this goes to the, I guess, the aspect of, uh, you know, people say, you know, can you lose your salvation? Kind of like your, you know, can you lose your car keys or something like this? God does not lose anything. Mm-mm. He mm. knows exactly where it is. Mm-hmm. But there is a moment in time that he says, okay, I know where this, this so-called lost coin is. It's time to go retrieve it. Yes. Time to go find it. <laughs> I'm just yes. the house to look for it. Wow. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a cool, I like the way you put it like that. That's nice. Yeah. And when you put it in that context with that word, with its expounded meaning, it it sets up a, a better stage for the next parable of the prodigal son. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, just setting that stage of the, you know, what is the one that lost beyond retrieval? Uh, definitely. Yeah, like you said, just it just puts more weight on it for sure. So I, I want to bring out something that this young man we were talking about, um, and and I've had this conversation, I think more times in the last the last year than I have in in I can't remember when. People that say I just don't know if God can restore me. I don't know if God will give me His grace. I've I've done mm-hmm. this this this. And and I feel like I'm outside of the restoration of God. I mean, what do you say to that? How how do you, how do you what would be words that you would use in there? Mm. I think um, to put it those that those kind of questions get me so excited because that means because they're asking that it's because they are searching already they're like how can it be how can it be that i could be restored how can it seriously be that he would actually bring want me to enter into this rest how can that really be and it's like in in the question of them asking it's that yearning that that's where i'm that's what i'm Mm -hmm. so excited about there's the longing behind it and it's like i think uh, (laughs) Uh, oh man Two, ahead, two people, you're good. Two people that come into my mind in the scripture that Yeshua, you know, he really went for, we have so much, so many amazing accounts of him going to the outcast of the outcast of the outcast. You know, one example being the Samaritan woman. Yeah. The Samaritans in general were hated by the Jews. There was such a, um, there was mm-hmm. such a kind of this cultural battle between them that just kind of this you could equate it to modern day racism in some, in some senses, mm-hmm. you, they, yeah. they think of each other and it, they just don't, they didn't mesh very well. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. they did their own thing. We do our own thing. We don't mix with them. And so not only does he go to the Samaritans, but then within the Samaritans is this woman who is married and divorced many times and currently living a life of sin. And so just take a moment to kind of think about who she is this woman living within a cultural outcast from the main religion of the day nearby in Jerusalem. And even, 
you know, disassociated with her own people in that way. And yet Yeshua seeks her out and he spends time on her. And then you, you go from there over to um, the, the woman with the, the issue of blood. Mm-hmm. Someone who had spent so much time unclean and you know she was just walking around and people were, were looking at her and shouting unclean at her because they didn't want to be unclean. And so outcast in that way of a physical uncleanliness and yet Yeshua, you know, she was healed by him and he said, your faith has restored you. So we have these moments, we have these people, God was very good to us and in including many people that were not only not perfect, but actually pretty wretched people <laughs> in the scripture. Uh, some of the things you read is just, yeah, I can't even fathom that kind of thing. And yet mm-hmm. forgiven, they're forgiven, not only, but not only by Yeshua, but before Yeshua, you know, when it's just God, they are forgiven, they are restored, they face consequences, but they are restored. Yeah. So if, let me jump off what you just said, Dave, because like, that's, that's what I'm trying to get at that idea that, especially the woman at the well, that's perfect, literally perfect because, and she recounts like, oh, all this stuff and the heat and the Messiah then tells her, this is what you've gone through and everything. And by the end of that encounter, she then runs up to them people saying, this guy's told me everything I've ever done. And with that much joy. So in in that, that's where I'm so excited about is because the thing you think will keep you away from the kingdom, keep you away from the Messiah is actually doesn't matter at all. Because at, at the end of encountering the Messiah, it washes away. It doesn't even matter. It doesn't even hold weight anymore the guilt is gone the shame is gone it's just gone are the consequences still there of course they are yeah but you're gonna face those consequences with joy how many times have you met someone that you hear their testimony how their life was a mess turns around and the consequences they faced then were lessened even more my dear brother dear friend Nathan Stanley, I think we sure. you know, all met before yeah. that his story, which I hope one day some of you viewers can listen to. He went from just the darkest, darkest place you could have ever imagined. And you would have thought that he would have he reaped. He should have reaped every consequence thrown back at him. Mm-hmm. But God saved him because of that grace and mercy that he talks about so much. So that's what gets me so excited when people like Mike, what you say, when people come with this, there's no way. How can I? It's because, but you're here. Mm-hmm. You're asking. That's a step in the right direction. Let's get going with this then. That just gets me way too excited. Mm-hmm. And one thing I said on Shabbat that is most certainly going to offend someone's religion is <laughs> that it's, it's hard to grapple with sometimes, just to put it this simply, but God does not care where you were yesterday. Mm. He does not care where you were this morning or this afternoon. Pretty much no matter what it was, what he cares about is where people are right now, what they're going to do right now, and what they're going to do tomorrow. And guess what? Even if you were in the worst place yesterday or this morning, and you turn your heart to him, he doesn't expect perfection by tomorrow morning. It's not like you come and you receive salvation and all of a sudden you have to live the perfect life you come to salvation and that begins a process. And so, you know, let that be an encouragement to someone that you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have everything right about your walk. You know, Yeshua coming into your heart, into your life and being your king does not make you perfect. It does Mm -hmm. not make you all of a sudden understand everything that you should do just because you know him. It just starts a process. It's like meeting him, you're meeting him. And then you have conversations with him. And the more you get to know him, the more it changes you. And just, but just, just as they, going along with what we're saying, God does not care where someone was this morning. All that matters is right now, what they, what they decide to do right now. Mm-hmm. We see in the parable of the, the prodigal son, a lot of people, you know, they gloss over what he did when he asked his father, you know, go ahead and give me a, my inheritance. He wished his father dead. Mm -hmm. let me go ahead and have you die and so that i can get what's what i want so i can live the the lifestyle that i want to live and so really he brought shame upon 
the head of the father and upon his household, and especially in that day in the, those communities, uh, the whole community would have seen that. And so when we see him kind of come to his, his senses, he asked the same question um, that, that you had posed that a lot of people ask, Mike. He goes, uh, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Right. So he calls him to question his worthiness. And we know how the story goes. Most of us, you know, he, he comes back. And his father sees him coming from afar off and runs to him. Now, why is that important? Mm. Remember, he's brought shame to his family and his community by what he has done. So the community's watching to see what the father's reaction is going to be. And not only does he accept his son back, but he runs to him so that the entire community can see that he is going to bring his son in as his son. He gives him a robe. He gives him a ring. He calls him son. But this is my son was dead and is alive again. It says he was lost and now is found. And they were all, they all were merry. Hmm. That's profound to think about the creator of the universe. When you're even in the midst of you questioning your worthiness is willing to take off his sandals and run to you. Yeah. You know, the, uh, a song that was made famous by uh, Phillips, Craig and Dean, this, this is, this song goes back to, I think older than you guys. Uh, it's about the prodigal son. And the, the name of the song is um, when God ran. Mm. And it, I don't know how many times I've heard that song. Uh, it's on YouTube. People can go and, you know, and search it out real quick. And uh, if you can get through to the end of that song without, without tears, uh, <laughs> more power to you. Cause I can't, uh, the verse says, uh, or the part of the song says, the only time I ever saw God run is when mm. he ran to me took me in his arms, held me close to his chest and said, son, you've come home. Uh, just that concept, you know, is, is just, it is beyond my comprehension. The fact that he has that much love. I, I cannot fathom. I was thinking about this this morning early. I cannot fathom that kind of love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let me uh, go, ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, this it just dawned on me. So I, I led worship on Shabbat before we, you know, let, kind of leading a discussion, and I got through my four songs that I planned to do, and mm -hmm. got to a, a fifth one that I wasn't really sure if I was going to do it or not. I didn't end up doing it, and this this song just came to me. It, it's Oh, but just... for some reason, do it. You you cut out there. Oh, um, it's not a song that you would normally play in a corporate worship setting, but it came to my mind. Yeah, I believe the Holy Spirit put it there, and especially now because I'm realizing that I sang this song on Shabbat, probably sometime around the time when this all this happened with this young man yeah. or before. And let me just read, read some lyrics of it. So the first verse is essentially saying you know, I went the wrong way. You know, I did, I did things that made my innocence go away. That's kind of the, the gist of the first verse. And then the chorus is come on home, home to me, and I will hold you in my arms and joyful be. There will always, always be a place for you at my table. Return to me. Hmm. And here's, here's the second verse that I just love. It just give, bear with me. It's kind of long. Wondering where I might begin. I hear a voice upon the wind. She's singing faint, but singing true. Son, there ain't nothing you can do. Listen close and follow me. I'll take you where you're meant to be. Just don't lose faith. So I put my hand upon the plow and I wipe my sweat, wipe the sweat up from my brow. I plant the good seed along the way as I look forward to the day when at last I see my father run to me, singing, oh, my child. So I was singing that song just a little bit before <laughs> that I was not planning on singing. Mm -mm. man how about that yeah i wow. think that's where that relation 
because we're talking about the parable that happens right after, I think there's also that before the leaving the 99 sheep mm -hmm. to go after the one sheep also plays a significant role into this. Because I think that if any of you have ever had an animal, I know when we have with our farm, we'll have the uh, like recently we had uh, baby goats and one of the goats was struggling really, really bad. And uh, everybody jumped in to help out with that. Unfortunately, the goat didn't make it, and it's just a way of kind of how a farm kind of works sometimes. Yeah. But there have been times where some animals are reaching that door of death, and there's something about it, and I think that's that how we relate sometimes with animals is there so that we can then have at least a glimpse of an understanding as to mm -hmm. how God will want, reacts to us when that long lost animal comes back after being gone for days and days and days. Then, but with us, it's years and years and years. Mm -hmm. And then we finally come to our senses, like in the prodigal son, and we run, we're like, please just give me anything. I'll lick, I'll lick the dust off the floor if I have to. It's better here than out there. And God goes, nah, -uh, that's not how this is going to be. And that, and that's pretty uh, overwhelming to realize that He has that kind of love for us in that mm -hmm. sense where it's like, we deserve. To lick the dust off the ground but he says no 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 no, not here not you mm. that's just it gets it gets me every time and the yeah. songs sung that's because good. of it is so amazing oh yeah i, I want to mm. back up just a little bit if you guys don't mind if you do i'm going to yes. do it anyway um <laughs> but uh, ryan you you, you kind of went over something there that i've never i've never thought about at all um when the prodigal son comes to the father, to his father, and says, I want my inheritance, it is as if he's saying, I were just as soon you were dead. Yes. Yep. We went over that way too fast. Mm -hmm. Because I, I know many people I've talked to that said, you know, uh, I just, you know, I, I, I walked away from God. Uh, he was like dead to me, you know, or, or somebody says, well, you know, I don't believe in God. And I normally look at him and say, well, that's okay. Because he still believes in you. Um, <laughs> but you know, th this, the, the seriousness of this prodigal son is that he was literally saying, I wish that you were dead so that I could have what is mine. That's the same thing many people do in looking to God is, you know, God's mm -hmm. dead. He's dead to me. This is the, this is a statement of an agnostic, of an atheist. He's dead to me, but yet no we still see him. him walk. You know, we still see him in their lives. Mm -hmm. mm. That's right. Um, you know. A lot of times, I think people have to, they have to have their reasons in order to, you know, excuse whatever their desires for their own behavior mm -hmm. uh, is going to be. And so, unfortunately, that sentiment is prevalent uh, this day and age. Uh, they'll say, you know, well, there is no God or I don't believe in God. Uh, he's dead to me because I want to be able to live this way and it's contrary to what his word is. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's unfortunate, and, and, you know. I know for all of us, for all of us, our prayer is that they would be like the prodigal son mm -hmm. and one day say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's a sad thing. It, it, it certainly is. Look, let's I will another... those people to much joy. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, let, let's take another spin at this thing then. <clears throat> I just noticed something as we were kind of going through here that uh nothing is in scripture by chance i i mean i know that okay um is it interesting that it says that it was 10 pieces of silver and mm -hmm. one piece one tenth and and i'm i'm going with the you know not what you said ryan but i'm going with the uh this is 10 equal pieces of silver okay okay so one tenth of her in of her monetary value, her wages, whatever it is, one tenth had been lost. 
So could she not have said, well, you know, <laughs> I mean, that's just God's part. So why should I look for it? Oh, wow. Oh, I was, on, I was honestly thinking toward the same way I had when we first wrote it or read it. I wrote down one tenth tire. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Run with yeah, it, guys. No, Y'all aren't yeah, related I, I, at all. No, definitely not. <laughs> I, I think that is, I think that there is something there. Um, ooh, but where do you go with it? Um, <laughs> there can be this approach. Yes. Like, like you were kind of hinting at the, at the last bit there, Dad. There can be this approach toward tithing that the, the 10%, the 10th is the most dispensable. It's the most, you know, like that is, okay, I got to set that aside for God because I have to, you know, I mean, maybe I can make an argument that you don't have to, but I guess I will. And so, yes, it disappears and it's like, oh, well, you know, it'll make its way to God somehow, you know. <laughs> he owes but, um, it. Yeah, oh, man. Woo. But, but, but you tie that into the verse in Malachi, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe it's Malachi, where, you know, God is basically daring his people to tithe to him. You know, yeah. why don't you go ahead and I, I dare you to see how I will open up the floodgates of heaven upon you. Those are basically the verbiages that it uses. And and so I, I think of these two things in light of each other and how when you real mm, here it is. When you realize the immeasurable multiplication factor that that one tenth has, you will never look at it the same way again, and you will mm. never give it up before the nine out of ten. Right. Meaning, mm. a a time spent in the quiet place setting. That one tenth, whatever you have, whatever you are able to do, the time spent setting aside that one tenth yields tenfold, twentyfold, a hundredfold. And once you realize that, and I've experienced this in my own life, mm -hmm. ridiculous. Like mm -hmm. when I was first married, um, so we, Casey and I got married, and she was working at the time, I was working, and three, uh, three months in, we got pregnant uh, our first child and um with, with ruben and she got super pregnancy you know morning to kind of stuff so she had to stop working and at the at the same time my boss's wife came down with breast cancer and at the same time our work shut off like a faucet mm -hmm. it just we had no work and so here i am my wife can't work anymore um you know we have a baby on the way and there's no work so I'm freaking out entirely, 100%. Every part of me is freaking out, trying to trying to maintain faith. And so the next years, of course, you know, most people's first years of marriage is not the most financially stable in the world. And that's okay. There's a, a very deepening bond that happens as you grow through those trials together. But there was many, many times where I made very good reasons to myself why God would want me to use that tithe to help me pay off my debt because then I would be able to get out of debt faster than I could give more. You know, I mean, I came up with some really, really good reasons why oh. God would want me to, but I never did. Mm -hmm. I, I never stopped setting aside that 10% for nothing to do with myself for giving. And I see in my life now how I truly, truly believe that God has rewarded that faithfulness. <laughs> And because of those times that I've seen where it didn't matter how much I had or how little I was making, setting aside that one tenth, that 10%, I will never give that up because the math does not work like <laughs> kingdom math does not work like earthly math. That's true. Oh. Let me, you, you talking about this, Daniel, kind of got me started from last week's topic about the one who took it and buried it. Could it not be said then if she didn't look for that one that she had the master gave her 10 or 11, I guess we'd say, and one got lost and was essentially buried away. Do you not think the master would have gone, what happened to the one? I gave you this. What happened to what's the account of it all? Oh, you didn't even look for it. You didn't go even try to find it. Mm -hmm. You didn't That's try to clean it up. Mm -hmm. That it's it goes back to that same idea you said that 
no matter what you still gave because you knew that you had to do it. You took account that this was for him because the I give this much as small as it ever was, right? As small as it ever was, what it did accomplish was something that you could not describe. Yeah. Because I know when, when you're starving, you're hungry, $10 is something un- unbelievable, right? Something small, so a small monetary value is something beyond. You can make that stretch so much. So seeing it being given to someone else, but then when the God uses that to be able to, for kingdom purposes, it's like the fish, right? Mm-hmm. It's like the it's like, it's like that parable, it. right? The fish and the bread, and it was able to feed thousands. Mm-hmm. That's that's his multiplication for it. <laughs> yes, that, I kind of look at that. Those parables kind of connect to the there too. So we we're talking about connecting mm-hmm. parables there. Mm. I see it uh, to to kind of add to that as well. She's very intentional with this one, mm-hmm. with this one tenth. Uh, it reminds me of a uh, teacher that I heard recently, and I won't name any names. It's their story, but um, they had gone out to eat, and on their way home, they were at a red light and saw a guy there that was begging for food, signs you know, hungry. And so they gave him their leftovers, which most people would be like, oh, how wonderful, you know, gave him something to eat and go on. They got up to the next red light and they were like, I can't believe I, I served the God I serve and I gave that man leftovers. <laughs> so they turned around, went back to the guy who was happily there, you know, eating the leftovers and was like, I'm sorry, I gave you my leftovers. Now I want you to come with me and let me treat you to a meal a good meal of your choosing because I serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were intentional in that, that giving and intentional to make it the best that they could afford. Made it matter. I think that's exactly made it matter. I think that's important as well. Um, you know, just like we see with her, she's very, she's obviously very upset over this one. And she's very intentional in finding it. Uh, so that it can be used presumably in the way it should be used versus like we were talking about earlier, just like, Oh, well it it was God's anyway, you know? Yeah. So, so Ryan to, uh, to kind of play off of that one just a little bit, I guess the question needs to be asked, do we give God our leftovers? Ooh. Oh, oftentimes. Ah. <laughs> yep. yeah. What is okay? Let, let's just let's just take it here, and you know, I'll I'll go ahead and shoot some holes in the boat here. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do that real well with Barry Phillips. He, he's he, most of our program is about him trying to patch up the boat. <laughs> so we get to the seventh day and give him our leftovers. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, I've had a long week and oh, it's been difficult. And I, I just barely made it here. I just, I, I just need to sit back oh. in the corner and just, man, and just... you shot, you really shot it. You weren't even going for the oh. money. Going for sure. <laughs> <time. Ooh. laughs> you know, I don't have Ooh. time. I don't, I don't have the energy to stand up. I, I know the song says that I'm lifting my hands, but I'm just lifting my heart unto him. Uh, yeah. But you know, I just get I can't make it. Is I mean, is that the attitude? What 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 if you know? Mm. What if people gave the same attitude toward their employer? You know what they'd be called? Fired. Yes, unemployed. <laughs> unemployed. Uh, or or actually, I guess today it's it's like you know, if you can breathe, you can come in here and work. But uh, mm-hmm. it's a little different in our day. But are we are, are we giving God the leftovers of our day, giving him the leftovers mm-hmm. of our week at Shabbat? Uh, you know, kind of like, well, I, I'm, I, I don't have anything left, so I'm just going to kind of do nothing, you know. Uh, I'll just stay home. Mm. You didn't shoot a few holes in the boat. You fired a broadside, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> So, so yeah. maybe we should be looking at uh, this this Shabbat. Let's uh, let, let's plan on going to service, giving God a, f- a full meal, of mm-hmm. His choosing. That's right. And it's it's a perception issue too, because if you if you view Shabbat as day seven mm-hmm. of the week, and that's all, then that's all you're going to be able to give. But if you view Shabbat as like what it is, as this oasis 
this oasis once a week that we get to that we ever start, you know, starting on Saturday night, you look forward to that day with him and then you have that day and then you flow out of that day to that day. You know, it's not just day number seven. It's an oasis in the desert of the week and the toil and the labor. And, and when you view it, when you change your perception of it to what it is, then you don't want to give it your leftovers. At least, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> you may still be in the in the area where, you know, flesh is weak, but the spirit yearns. But it's better for the flesh to be weak and the spirit to yearn than for the flesh to be weak and the spirit to not yearn because mm-hmm. there's just absolutely nothing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the same can be true of money where you go through your whole month and it's like, well, I really need a... I need a new this this month and I need a new this and I got all this take, stuff taken care of. Well, I got, I got $10, you know, I can give that to, I can, I can, I can give that to God. You know, I, I'm, I'm at the end of the month. We got everything else cleared. I got a little bit left. I can give that to God. His stuff comes first. That, that comes first. Mm-hmm. That's right. Dave, you I think that you're right. There? The perception change. That perception change, you got to think of it that way, that you're looking forward to the Shabbat versus it's just the seventh day of the week. That's the, everything that matters. It, once you change that perception, it just it totally revolutionizes the way you live. It really does. It's true. It's yeah, true. Lenny and Varda do a song. Lenny and Varda Harris, uh, a friend of mine for, for many years, do a yep. song. It's only six days till, till Shabbat. Mm-hmm. you know it, it's not that uh shabbat is the left shabbat's the meal shabbat's the shabbat should be what we're uh somebody told me a couple of days ago they said they remembered me saying at some point i don't even remember how i said it exactly but uh it, it's like when it, it's shabbat is should be the culmination of everything that we do that we that we work for everything that we do upon this earth should be the culmination and Shabbat should be the most exciting day of our week because we get to come together and share what the Almighty has done for us and through us and in us in the other six days. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. That's, that is exactly right. Mm-hmm. And then we can say, Go ahead. Uh, we can say as she did, we'll call our friends and neighbors and say, rejoice with me for I have found my lost coin. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I- yeah, my last, my lost coin. I found Shabbat. Uh, Shabbat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, let, let let me look at let's look at one thing here. Um, and uh, this this is kind of the, the 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 icing on the cake verse here. In the same way, I tell you, there is joy among Elohim God's angels when one sinner repents. You know. Mm-hmm. As, as I was praying with this young man the other day, I said to, I looked at him and said, heaven has stopped to rejoice over you. Yeah. Think about that. I mean, j- just consider that for a moment. 100%. That whatever is going on up in the heavenly realm, and, and I have a funny feeling it's a pretty busy place. Mm-hmm. But when one person turns and and says yes and and decides you know to follow the almighty the the angels stop what they're doing to rejoice over that that's the the book this present darkness and Pierce in the darkness written by frank Breddy. um would i go to them for doctrine no but Mm -hmm. i think they point a very good picture of the reality of the spiritual world and the spiritual warfare. And my favorite scene from those books, I read them over 10 years ago, well over 10 years ago. And the scene, the one scene that sticks with me above anything else I read in that book is if following this one woman who is lifestyle of sin, but you can see in the spiritual world, the battle over her life. And she finally gives in, she finally gives her life to God. And it, it, it shifts into the spiritual world. And it's, it's, it depicts the, what we just read there so beautifully of what the angels are doing as she gave to her life. And this, this light that is coming off in the spiritual realm and how there is no darkness that can penetrate that moment. That moment is so precious. 
to God. Mm. Of and he he's not letting anything penetrate that moment. Hmm. Let that sink in for a minute, actually. <laughs> yeah. It, sure. How much do we really think about that realm? And what's going on? I, I think that, you know, again, as Daniel just said, uh, to read those books for doctrine, no, uh, not going there. But I remember when the books came out and the impact that they had on people's lives who, though they were going through a lot of uh, maybe religious activity on a weekly basis, they had never really considered the battleground that was that was around them. Uh, and this is where uh, a good friend of mine used to say that uh, we should look at this world and, and the life that we live, uh, not as a playground, but a battleground. Because truly, the battle is going on and is a battle for you and I. Mm -hmm. All right, that, that, the depth of that is, is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's ramping up, too. We see it in the world around us. The dark is becoming darker and the light is becoming lighter. Yeah, that's true. Or situate in situations where you find yourself actually giving that uh, message to somebody is be is coming in stranger and stranger ways. Mm -hmm. the, the people that are that you would never have expected to be lost sheep are actually lost sheep. Think about like that idea that you like oh they're just they're lost completely lost. There's no one, and you don't realize that it's actually not that hard to actually reach out to those. They're actually so ready. And I think that's where that comes from. That whole idea of we don't realize where someone's struggling with. We don't realize what they're going through. And you just might be that person. We talked about this few week, few episodes ago. You just might be planted in the one spot where you're supposed to have that joy and that light because that, that darkness is surrounding them. But that joy, that light that can come into that person's life in that moment. And they're, they're so hungry. And they're so ready for it. Nothing takes, nothing will take it away. Nothing will take that away. It's if, if you've never been in that situation where you get to help with them seeing that it will seriously about, it'll about make you levitate. It just, <laughs> it's so much joy coursing through your own body that you just about levitate off the ground. Gravity just almost doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> You're so excited and so happy. And the fear of man doesn't matter at all that in that, just that moment, it's just like all that disappears, everything. So I, I can't, I, we would love if you've ever had that happen, please write to us on purpose at mail.com. Mm -hmm. yeah. Please let us know how that went. It's so amazing to hear your testimonies. It's so good when you guys have talked to us and reached out to us about things that either you're struggling with or that what you got to see, it brings so much joy to us when we get to hear that. Yeah. So please, please do that. We, we really appreciate what you guys do. Mm -hmm. And Go to the parable of the sowers for just a minute. It it says that the the seed that fell on the rocky ground, you know, the birds came, the, the birds came and ate it immediately. You know, that is how ravenous the enemy is over yeah. any good thing that comes into our lives. And so just giving credence to this battleground mindset, you know, think of Think of really valuable things on this earth throughout history where people have fought wars over materials. They fought war over gold and the precious things. And that is exactly what's happening over us. We are, we are the most precious commodity to the father. And there is that battle going on for us. You know, the enemy is trying to steal every good thing that comes, steal, kill, and destroy. And the father is trying to restore He's in the business of restoration. Business mm -hmm. is good for anyone mm -hmm. who wants to take part in it. It's a, it's a pretty good business to invest in. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Great returns. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Extremely. The unmatched, unparalleled. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm thinking back to the coin. We'll finish with this one is, um, you know, what would have... I wonder what that woman did. did. Did she just kind of wander around the house and, or did it sometimes she said, she looked up to the heavens and said, could you let me in on where this coin's at? Mm -hmm. 
and and all of a sudden she looked down i, I remember uh my mother Daniel daniel's uh, grandmother that uh, had dementia uh as the dementia was uh was getting worse and worse uh she would you know she the, the littlest thing in life uh she would just stop and say okay god now where did i put that and, and all of a sudden she'd look over and there it is sitting there and um as as her life was coming more to an end her faith became more childlike uh and and in fact i could probably say that her faith became more evident mm. and at times deeper than it ever than i had ever seen it in her life um you know maybe maybe you and i uh there's there's a coin out there and uh that coin has been lost and maybe the father would like us to to you know go knock on the 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 lady's door next door and say um is there something wrong here you know have you lost something and and let me help you find it let me help you because maybe that we're talking about a relationship that people have with god and they're looking around going i think i've lost that relationship and maybe you and I are being brought into their lives to help them find it again. Mm -hmm. That's right. I mean, kind of in the middle of what you're saying there, Mike, it's almost like uh, maybe take the from from whenever you're listening to our broadcast, if it's on Shabbat, then have a wonderful Shabbat. But maybe uh, between then and the next Shabbat, maybe consider as you're just going around your mundane, just the typical the mundane grocery shopping. Yep. Maybe be like what you just said, Grandma. Just look up to heaven and go. Can you show me where that lost coin is? Yeah. yeah. Is there maybe any lost coins lost in this coin. door? Is there a lost <laughs> coin in this store? Maybe there's someone that's a yeah. special coin that you need to reach out to. Mm -hmm. Something to think about. Yeah, absolutely. Daniel, Ryan, finish up. What Dave said. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, he's taken that way out, I see. Oh. <laughs> <Hot potato. laughs> no, I you know, it's interesting that in the parable, one of the first things she does before she starts looking is she lights a lamp. Mm. She sheds light on the on the subject and then she begins to sweep the house. And so, like you said, Mike, as we are in our mundane lives, let's keep our lamps lit so that we can see where that lost coin might be. And the only way to do that is to have oil. And the only way to have oil is to spend time, not leftover time, but spend intentional time with the father there so that he go. can pour his oil into you. There you go. That, that, I, that's a wrap. I, that's the one. Yes. Yeah. I think that's a good place to, to end this program. So, mm -hmm. um, well, for everyone out there, um, understand that you're not listening to this podcast by accident mm -hmm. you didn't just well somebody sent me a link and and uh told me to listen no no you're listening to this because maybe you're that lost coin maybe you're that prodigal son maybe you're that lost sheep and the father is saying to you i have plans for you mm -hmm. for a future and a hope not for good not for evil but for good I want to give you future hope and a kingdom in my presence. So live life on purpose. Next time. We'll see you guys next week. You alone hear my every prayer. You're the God who's always